Hello and welcome to the art and aesthetically a That's what we do. That's what, well, that's what I do. Hello and welcome, Denzians of the internet and fellow weird kids. Not you weirdos, there's a difference. You can be weird, but don't be a weirdo. Weirdos are dangerous, kids. Don't trust weirdos. Weird people, ah, but weirdos, uh-uh. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. You need to run. You need the one. This is where I sit and I read stories and then I review them and you guys get to sit and watch me speed paint on something. Um, whether it's a picture or some swatches or just random stuff, who knows? But either way, like, you know, we're, like, we're, we're doing that. I'm actually thinking about taking like some of my old artwork and applying this here as well because I got all that. Anyway, um, today's story is The Temple by H.P. Lovecraft or Howard Philip Lovecraft. Um, he was an early 1900 American author from Providence, Rhode Island. He was born August 20th, 1890, and he died March 15th, 1937. So he was like a Leo with a pinch of a uh, Virgo. For people who believe in cusp, he'd be a Leo Virgo cusp. Lovecraft was well known for his weird and horror fiction that's influenced a great deal, if not all the horror in some way or another. Uh, you know the movie Congo? That's actually an H.P. Lovecraft, um, story. How about the mo how about the Alien series? You know how, like, there's this weird thing that's just stalking the crew and the peoples and doing horrible things and all this shit? Yeah, that's, um, that that's inspired by, like, the cosmological horror of, uh, Lovecraft, which is actually something that he is, he's literally the father of. Lovecraftian horror, or cosmic horror, or if you want to sound really fancy, cosmological horror is a type of horror that leaves the reader with an unsettling feeling of being as insignificant as an ant compared to the strange and benevolent beings the author creates. And there's a chance your eyes will burn out if you read enough of it. Uh, in fact, Lovecraft is a very author of the well-known Cthulhu and the Call of Cthulhu, one of the most influential stories of his legacy. And for anybody you don't know, Lovecraft, like, he never really made a living with his writings while he was alive, and he died at the early age of 46, literally in the same hospital both of his parents died in. Like, his father, I think his father died in it first. Years later, his mother followed. Um, he ended up being more taken care of by his aunts and stuff. He was married for a minute, and... Well, his wife, she tried. She tried, and she could not. She could not. Like, he... I, like, I think that bothered him a lot, but it was just like, it, it, he, he just could not. He, he it, like, it, like, she just couldn't. She couldn't. He actually, well, it was mainly because of his, um, his beliefs, which changed gradually over time. He started getting older. He started understanding a little more. So he really wasn't of the uh, racer mindset like he used to be before he passed away. But he didn't live long enough for people to actually, I believe, peep that. You know what I mean? You finally get where you went wrong and then all of a sudden, and you're trying to get on the rightness of the path. But then all of a sudden you're taken out for no fucking reason. That was kind of like what it was with Lovecraft. So a lot of people still say things about like who he was. But I think that he changed right in the nick of time before he actually like started getting sick and stuff. He did, you could tell by his writings, he didn't think the way he did. Speaking of his writings, it was after his death, his writings actually became some of the most renowned in the genre of horror, having its own category. Like Lovecraft has his way of being long-winded in all of his writings. Like someone who can talk for hours about like whether or not they're hungry. Going through charts and graphs, and shit. like he never did that in his writings, but it was like, you know, pretty close. Um, he would go back over words with new words and new phrasings and new ways of going about those phrasing of the horrors and he made sure that it was just vague enough to be that disturbing to the reader yet in his longing to dribble on and on on the paper his investigative voice and his journalistic deliverance of his stories make it sound similar to listening to the jaded detective telling you the tales of a man who witnessed too much and went mad over time it's kind of romantic actually when you really think about it because it's just like oh he, he like look at him look at him he's doing a good ass job making sure people's eyes burn out from reading his stories it's a it, like honestly i think that's like really cool. lovecraft does have a lot of controversy now i talked about this earlier with his um beliefs mainly the one where it's xenophobic pretty racer i like saying racer so the other one because it makes sense uh, you know he, um the cat the name 
if you if you don't know the original name of that cat in the rats in the walls and you're sensitive oh you are either gonna have a treat or a fit it's one of the two just take your it, it also kind of seemed like his favorite word did seem to be negro he, 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 but straight enough he was more xenophobic than he was a racer and that's the thing that fucks me up it's just like huh you just don't want to do one in your house okay I, mean, I guess that makes sense but those tendencies and thoughts and if, if they were outlandish even for his time this man said stuff that made his friends uncomfortable and like he was white as could be right and, and even his friends were like dude you're doing way too much this is making me think about how i must sound i don't like how this, like he was literally changing people's lives maybe the worst person i think which is like it's so interesting when people like live like the jester but turn out to be a fool now what's strangely enough is that all of that all of those tendencies all those thoughts all those um outlandish things that he would say even during his time that's what fueled the power inspiration of his fear of the unknown as much as he could be uncomfortable with friends and families with his ridiculous belief system of others he was able to make that belief a vital powerhouse when it came to fear and what is beyond what our minds can comprehend and it always seems like you know my demographic which is block well like we're like it's almost like we're connected to the um the most powerful beings but he always makes us ignorant but it's really like do we need to really be as intelligent as you to get away with this shit you can't even figure out how to deal with this fuck creature with that eyeballs coming out you know it's like a backhanded compliment honestly so i don't know if i should be mad or grateful it's the little things you know like and, and then you sit there and think about it it's just like well wait is it when it, it, like you know like um yeah he's kind of calling us like creatures but at the same time us creatures apparently can survive this thing while no one else can so why are you saying our stupidity is a protection or you're mad because you got rejection. I, I, I don't know. It, 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 like, when you sit there and think about Lovecraft long enough, you're going to get pissed. You really will get pissed. Now, H.P. Lovecraft, I have heard of many times in my lifetime over the years. I heard about him, but I never read any of his stories. And I happened to find his works through this app on Facebook. Um, and I think it was called, like, iBooks, if I remember. Or iReads, or I don't know. It was, like, almost this interactive, like, thing on a phone where, like, you could read like the short stories and the short stories were like cut down a lot like one of the first ones was actually the hound then there was one about like him looking out a window and then the third story was dagon uh, they were all very very much shortened um to a certain extent but not too much where it took away from the story and as i read those stories opened my eyes i was like what now this dumbass app it didn't carry the entire writings of the story like i said but it did carry the main part but honestly when i was reading it i was really bothered with the fact that there wasn't more details involved but my brain was working its ass off making images of my and it's the craziest thing like when i do the hound on here you'll understand but it's like the way he worded things, he didn't need to use a lot of words to describe what was happening. But you didn't really want to know what happened. Like, you want to know what happened, but you don't want to know what happened. Because it seems like there's a reason why he doesn't want to tell us, right? That's the vibe you always get from H.P. Lovecraft. Right? Now, I, but as I'm reading these stories, I couldn't stop looking at the screen as I read the words of what happened to the main characters and the thing that was also in the story. The first story I ended up reading was The Hound. The Hound is actually my very favorite Lovecraft story. Just because it was the very first, and it fucked me up once I read it. I think The Cave was on that too. No, it was on a different app or something. I want to think it was, but like, nah. I really don't know. I really don't know. I could be wrong. So anyway, let's go to the story. It, it's um, a weird one. It's a weird one, and it actually took me a few reads to actually understand what the hell was happening in this story. Lovecraft wrote the story in 1920, probably around the time he and Frank Belk Nat Long were kicking it, and it was published in 1925 in the pulp magazine. Weird Tales, which I think still runs to this day, but I just want to point out that he wrote this in 1920, but it wasn't published till 1925. Now, I want you to think about it. This story actually took a pretty good long time to get done. 
And maybe he just took his time publishing. He's just like, oh, I lost it. Here it is. Now, the story starts out telling the reader that this is a manuscript found on the coast of the Yucantan, written by a Karl Heinrich Graf von Alterberg Einerstein. I know I fucked something there up. Uh, like, I'm good at German, but I know I fucked that up. Who was a lieutenant commander of the Imperial Navy of Germany, and he was in charge of the U-29 submarine. I guess he wrote this out and decided to stash it into a bottle so someone could find it, and dated the manuscript for August 20th, 1917. Lovecraft's birthday! Happy birthday, Ryan! Now, for reference, this is the year prior to World War One ending. What a lot of people don't know about World War One is that the German people relied on a lot of, like, the history lesson, right? The German people relied on a lot of marine shipping, and during World War One, the British were blockading the German port, and this caused a lot of problems for the Germans during the war. Their people were starving out because of the blockade, and worse, they had English prisoners, and the British made sure to let the Germans know that if their soldiers were not fed well, the Germans would be getting some shit for it. their soldiers. Anyway, the German soldiers that they had as POWs. So not only were the German people starving, they also had to give better care to the soldiers of the government that is causing their people to starve. And worse, the Americans were kind of backdooring them. The Americans were chilling with the British on the DL, pretty much ignoring the Germans who were pleading for assistance from America at the time, literally on the doorstep of the White House, had the door slammed in their face, and they went back to eat biscuits and crumpets with, and tea with the goddamn British. Um, then there was the whole attack and the sinking of the Latunza, which was a warship that was decorated as a cruise ship. Uh, they traveled so far into German territory, turned off their lights, and just let things sink. Apparently it got attacked by, uh, or allegedly, I should, I should say. They say that a German, uh, U-boat attacked it, but you really wouldn't know. I think it was like a hundred and some odd, uh, Americans, 104 or so Americans on that boat, and they died. And that's how America pretty much got sucked into the war. That was the excuse. That was your history lesson for today. History is actually really fucked up, and America has a, a pretty shady history when you actually look at it. Like, as a side note, the whole Franz Ferdinand assassination, the Duke, the Duke, and, and that like, it supposedly started like the World War II when the Duke got assassinated. It took like five times to carry out the assassinations because the assassins were kind of incompetent. The assassins also suffer from tuberculosis or some shit that affected their lungs. And then when they got caught, they stuck them in cold cells and sprayed them with freezing cold water. Like, uh, uh, go look up some symptoms and think about it. Like, that's the only reason I, I like. I think there was something called the Black Hand or the Black Brotherhood. Or I'm, I'm thinking of Skyrim, maybe, but that's actually the uh, background for that. But yeah, like, and, and but honestly, it's because the. I think it's because the French were still mad about Alsace Lorraine. I think they were still mad about Alsace Lorraine. Oh, oh which if you don't know, it's, it was a it was a territory that was absolutely useless. It was a territory that was absolutely useless. The Germans had control of it. They and like when France for now was taken out, the Russians were sitting there being like, "Hey, France, um, the Germans just did this shit, right?" And France who are nothing but psychos. Like, let's be clear, we all make fun of France because, like, we make fun of them, like, being, I guess, surrenderers or some shit. But did they ever lose a war? Th have they ever lost a fuck? Have they ever lost a war? I'm not sure. Well, I know as soon as the Russians came in there and told them that, they were ready to go. They were ready to go like the French they don't like they may lose but they don't give a damn they're gonna like I'm just saying there's a whole bunch of conspiracies going on but it's really weird how it all worked out to where like certain like countries benefited but I'm not saying too much you know I'm an ignorant American what, what, what do I know other than the empirical measurement system what do I know everyone's sick of shit what do I know as an American I am American <laughs> Let's see. Anyway, back to the story. So Carl tells us that he is on a sub at 20 degrees latitude, 35 degrees longitude, which I googled, and I think it's the Pacific Ocean where he's at the bottom of the sea. He pretty much wants people to know what's going on, but you know, the guy's pretty off. Uh, the guy's there's something wrong, Carl. He, he seems off. He, he just attacks, especially when he starts bringing up his iron German wheel. With each word having the first letter capitalized, like it's the beginning of a sentence or it's an article. In quotations, because, you know, like, I'm quoting him, but I feel as though that doesn't illustrate enough 
What's wrong with Carl? I'm just saying. He talks about his Iron German will in the beginning of this telling this horror story, right? Um, this is a guy who's pretty much the last man standing after pretty much losing his mind in the worst way ever, I would think anyway, which is pride. So Carl says that on the afternoon of June 18th, he torpedoed another sub and allowed the crew to get off in boats and flee after they were attacked. He was actually pretty proud of it. And mind you, this guy is off. The dude is not off his rocker. He, he okay, he, like, this is a story recounting from someone who's insane, so let's keep that in, in check. He was pretty proud of it and regrets that knowing we'll see the film of the enemy's sub sinking. And when his sub services, a certain body is found on the deck clinging to the railing. They determine that it's either an Italian or a Greek. Once again, this is H.P. Lovecraft. Don't be surprised by his choice of words in describing people because he's already dead. Carl describes the young crewman as rather handsome. This young body seems to be, or it was, one more victim of an unjust war of aggression which the English pig dogs are waging upon the fatherland. Did I tell you all he was off his rocker? I, I sure did. I did tell you he was off his rocker, and he is. So they search the dude for his pocket treasures and find an ivory statue that looks like a young person with a laurel as a crown. I don't know what a laurel is. I think it's that wreath thing. I think it's a wreath thing. I don't know, they put it around horses when they're winners of races or some I I I want to think a laurel is a reef thing but I don't feel like looking it up but yeah I don't know what a laurel is but we'll just go with it I'm not googling it I don't care a fellow officer by the name of lieutenant Kynes dying that the object is special it takes it from the crew for himself he took it from the crew for himself he took it from the crew for, I want you to think about it. why did he take it from someone else for himself it's just the object Take your time. As they throw the dead guy off the sub deck, there are two things that happen to make every crew member other than Carl shit the bed. Which honestly, I think it made Carl shit the bed, but he's trying, but he's insane, so we'll go with that. The first thing that happens is as the body is being moved, its eyes open and stare straight at the two guys by the name of Schmidt and Zimmer and just stares at them in a mocking fashion, which I'm not even sure what that is. Then there's this older guy who is Muller. Who is a well? Well, Carl calls him a Muller, and then there's the older guy who's Muller, who Carl calls a superstitious as Alsantian swine who should have known better. That says that he watched the body in the water. The body, according to Mueller, sank a little into the water before his limbs started moving into a swimming motion and moved south away from the sub. Carl and Kynes didn't like this, and the next day was even worse. Many of the crew were having bad, bad dreams, and they were nervous suddenly. Carl says they got the stupid, and then he made sure they were actually suffering with something before relieving them of their duties at that time, which is like, you sit there and hear this, you sit there and hear it, and you're just like, wait a minute. It sounds like they're almost fighting over this statue, and then the next day, everyone's suffering the consequences of the statue that just is there, and now the people, the authorities, is being absolute dicks. Uh, going on, he also has the sub dive deeper into the water and says that this isn't where the calm ends for the crew. Which is like, okay. Thank you, tablet, but okay. Uh, a lot of the crew were actually getting sick and they weren't able to perform their duties well, but Carl was determined to intercept this other boat, and whatever it was. Uh, I believe it was a liner and it was called the Darcia, according to the info he got from the spies in New York. Don't mind me, I'm trying to remember. I wrote this like two years ago, but I, this is the first time I've reading it over in order to do this because I'm not writing this script again if I don't have to but I god I must have edited this when I was drunk at some point oh my god in the morning they rose to the surface and he claims that he could see the smoke from the battleship on the horizon he also says that they're safe enough and far enough to dive and still be safe but Carl and Kynes were more worried about Mueller apparently Mueller was having visions of dead bodies in the water staring at him through portholes of the sub he claimed that he recognized the bodies despite the bloating as those of the crew that had been killed during their time aboard. Apparently, the body they found with the statue was leading all of the dead people in the water. Everyone's sick, everyone's not sleeping well, and then we got this one dude like having visions and shit, and, and like the authorities are doing too much. I, I, I'm saying authorities, I should just call them the parents because this is how it's kind of feeling. Uh, so, what happened with that? What happened? What happened? Well, because Mueller was saying this. Carl and Kynes have Muller put in irons and whipped for speaking. Nobody agreed with this. 
at least not the crew, but Carl and Car but Carl doesn't care because Carl is already insane. Do you understand what's happening here? At this point, this crew has a statue and it's making them do crazy shit. They're whipping a guy for seeing some craziness. Very insane things, right? Oh, uh, also, what's even stranger is that Carl, he also refused a uh, lead requested delegation by Seaman Zimmer to throw the statue into the sea. But there isn't a reason for why the answer is no. And it's not told to the reader who actually refused to get rid of the fucking statue. But it's weird how only one person had the forethought to be like, hey, maybe we should get rid of this. And, but no one agreed. Then on June 20th, two seamen by the name of Smith and Bowen, and I think Smith was one of the two that like got figured out, who had been sick the day before turned violent and insane and the two I think are taken out and Mueller doesn't say anything else I don't know why they told me that Mueller doesn't say anything else but I guess that's important in the following week they're still waiting on this liner that's supposed to pass through and uh hmm he still hasn't shown up yet isn't that interesting worse all of the crew is on edge Zimmer and Mueller are missing. No one knows where they are. They just, Zimmer and Mueller are missing. Zimmer and Mueller are missing. But Carl doesn't care because he didn't like Mueller anyway. He hated him even though he didn't say anything else after being beaten for speaking up. I guess Carl assumes that the two killed themselves but no one witnessed them or found their bodies or actually anything. They're, they're completely disappeared. Was it cannibalism? See, like, and, and that's the thing. H.P. Lovecraft makes you think, well, maybe they cannibalize themselves instead of, like, going into the ocean to join the rest of the floating bodies. You, like, you would, like, you would almost want to think that. That that actually is the most logical answer in a scenario that's written by H.P. Lovecraft. And I'm not exaggerating with that. Cannibalism is absolutely an answer to any question you might have in H.P. Lovecraft, even though... He's never written about it, but you want to think that because it's like, oh, well, maybe that happened because they were hungry or something, but it's like, no, it's even worse than that. You're thinking of the good ending. No, he only writes the bad ones. So now the crew is just staying silent. They also stay underwater and the current is becoming weird to them, but no one does anything about it. No one says anything about it. No one is saying anything about it. No one's going to say any shit about this after what's been going on, I'm telling you. Kynes is on edge and apparently annoyed enough to yell at these strange dolphins that are sort of surrounding the sub. And now the southbound current is pulling them somewhere unknown, which is just like, first of all, weren't you guys like looking for another sub? Weren't you guys somewhere very specific in the Pacific? Um, why are you guys letting the current drift you away? That's so weird. Like, why do you need to do that? Why do you need to do that? And, and they don't know where they're going. Pretty soon they understood that they missed the Darcia, but they were kind of happy about it. Which is like, why? You, nobody, you, if you missed it, that means you might be lost. Is someone fucking with me right now? But now all the crew is just like, like all of the crew, they're just, they're just cool with it. But on June 28th, they go head northbound, but all the dolphins are still around them. Which I got, like, honestly, I don't think they're allowed to go anywhere except the direction those dolphins want to go. So, and then there was an explosion in the engine room earlier in the morning. And when Kynes goes to find out what happened, he finds two men, Ribe and Schneider, dead in the fuel tank and all the machinery basically destroyed in the explosion. But he still can't find Mueller and, and, and Zimmer, but okay. So now the situation is even worse. And even though they have enough air and food, they are still stuck where they're at and they can't exactly leave without dying from either drowning or the pressure from the ocean depths. Carl tells us that from then until, from June 28th, so about like four, five, six days, um, that is, until July 2nd that the sub was carried southbound and the dolphins have been surrounding them are still growing in numbers, which is just like, what's carrying the sub? Like, yeah, the engines and shit or whatever, but what the fuck is carrying the sub? Can't they just rise to the surface and use it like as a regular boat? I would feel a lot more comfortable with that and send out a signal, but I guess not. Also, the dolphins are growing in numbers. Um, at some point, there was an American warship, and a lot of the crew wanted to surrender so they could at least get out of the situation. One named Triub is shot by, lieutenant, by a lieutenant named Menz because he was getting violent, and then the rest of the crew got quiet again. Who fuck is men's? I don't know. But if you can't tell so far in the story um, who's cursed and who isn't, you... So the next afternoon, they see a bunch of birds coming from the south and the ocean is acting up. They either have to submerge or be drowned in the waves, which is still concerning because their electricity and air pressure are failing anyway since the explosion. Um, 
But it also makes me worry because this is like, did you actually see birds? Did, did you actually see birds? Anyway, so they submerged again until they think the water is way calmer, but then there's a new problem. The sub isn't capable of rising back up to the surface. And they were pretty much stuck, and the crew were freaking out about the statue again. But they stop when one of the officers shows a pistol. I don't know who, but it's very clear at this point that the higher-ups are more affected by the statue than the crew now. Like, they recognize that shit that has been wrong since the statue came on the sub, but the officers aren't listening and are definitely willing to shoot one of their own to maintain order. Carl and Kynes would sleep on different shifts, and it was on Carl's shift that a mutiny by the crew breaks out. Sure it did. Sure, of course it would be while Kynes, well, not Kynes, while Carl is up that a, a supposed mutiny star he like a, a, he just decides anyone's gonna mutiny a, 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 and like a, you'll see you'll see the crew was pretty much sick of their bullshit but mind you there's only six crewmen left and they're all screaming about the statue and the dead bodies and how it wasn't cool that they weren't didn't surrender to the american warship so carl just shoots all of them and makes sure none of them are alive i don't know if that includes lieutenant men's or not but he's not mentioned after that so i guess so they end up throwing the bodies of the crew through the double latch hatches and Kynes becomes an alcoholic, which is fair. Now, throughout the story, Carl is continually talking down on everyone else's heritage and ethnicity. He even refers to Kynes, his most loyal comrade, as a womanish Rhinelander, who is soft, even though Kynes and most of the crew were German descent, strangely enough. Carl seems like he has a problem with everybody who isn't him, but it's apparent that Carl is more, like, Carl is the problem, he keeps asking people what's wrong, and then becomes a problem again. It's very clear that like he's affected by the statue way more than he knows or even realizes, but I don't think he's gonna get out of it. And, and, like and spoilers, he doesn't. Well, like well, he does get out of it. Anyway, the two decide, or rather Carl decides, to stay alive in the sub as long as possible. They're still moving southbound, and the dolphins are still surrounding them. In fact, Carl notices that for two hours, one never goes to the surface for air. And this still doesn't weird him out or make him be like, maybe we should get rid of this. But no, he still wants to keep talking shit about the only other person alive with him. Who's praying over all the people they killed on their tour? Um, now it's not August 19th, and they're still going south in the ocean with all these weird dolphins still surrounding them. And it's just like, you know, it would have been really helpful to be able to possibly fix you if you hadn't shot all the people, Carl. I'm just letting you know. But that's just me. As they keep going, Kynes is noticing that the rock formations have markings on them, but Carl brushes him off. But he also can't help but notice that Kynes is uncomfortable looking at the rocks and Carl, as if he knows something that he isn't telling the other. I wouldn't tell him shit either. He keeps shooting people. On August 12th at 3.15 p.m. specifically, Kynes is finally nuts. He runs to the library where Carl is and says that he is calling. He is calling. I hear him. We must go. Who Kynes is talking about isn't said in the story, but if you're familiar with Lovecraft, you know who it is. Like, you already know who it is. There's only one person who calls for you. Now, Kynes had the statue in hand. In fact, Kynes has had the statue this entire fucking time. If you remember correctly, he took a crew member society that it was special and that he deserved it. He's had this this entire time. He's had this statue the entire time. Kynes has had the device of mass insanity this entire time. Literally, none of this would have happened if Kynes had thrown, had thrown the fucking statue in the water. But whatever. Now, at first, Carl tried to call Kynes, but Kynes is a servant. Like, well, now, Kynes had the statue in hand. And he began to drag Carl towards the hatch. And then Carl was like, Oh, whoa, 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 wait. What are you doing? We're going to the hatch. What do you mean we're going to the hatch? We're going to the hatch. What do you mean, Carl, we're going to the hatch? What do you mean, Kynes? Kynes. Like, what do you mean we're going to the like, hatch? Like, you don't understand. We must go to that. We must go. We He's coming. And then Carl realizes that Kynes wants them to go into the ocean. And he's just like, what? Like, at first, Carl tried to call Kynes, but Kynes is determined to go out, saying that it's better to go mad and seek the gods' mercy than stay defiant and face his wrath. I'm mean, just like, which god? Like, where are you at? Like, where, which god are you dealing with when you're, um, like, immortal dolphins dragging you southward to somewhere where you know you ain't supposed to be? It's just like, whatever. Um, eventually, Kynes just decides he's gonna go on his own. He'd rather go, he'd rather go outside. But strangely, Carl asks Kynes for the statue. Which is like, what do you want the statue for? 
Like, have we not learned a lesson? Isn't it strange that uh, all the things, the only reason Kynes is alive, I believe, is because he had that statue. That is it. Um, and Kynes had it in his, his possession for this entire time. However, Kynes laughs at him. And when Carl asks if he wants to leave the token, if Carl, if he wants to leave a token, if Carl is saved, and Kynes laughs again. Both laughs are psychotic, just so you know that. So Kynes and the statue head up to go out into the ocean, and Carl goes to the searchlight to see if he can watch Kynes' body be crushed by the pressure. But all of the dolphins made it hard to see anything. You can see shit. So at some point, Carl is sad that he didn't take the statue and that he has no one to talk to since Kynes is gone now, as if he cared. The next day, he's using the searchlight to see where he is when he notices that the ocean floor dips far down, just ahead of where he's floating. He ends up in a place called a mythical Atlantis, as he says, as he observes all the ruined places and buildings in the city that's up deep under the water. I wonder where this is. This is possibly the city of Riele controlled by <laughs> but we really don't know in the story from what we've been told but we can definitely surmise that motherfucker gone too far he should have gave the goddamn statue back but after two hours the sub sits in a plaza where from one side carl can see an outstretched underwater city that he's found including this large gold statue and that eventually he notices that this temple that's made of this strange large rock that has been carved into he's very much impressed by something that isn't german for once and he goes into the great detail about the beauty of the place and how unfamiliar everything is to a superior German intellect. He spends a long time just staring over the city and at some point he cuts the current to the power to conserve energy. Then he decides he should be the first German to explore this beautiful and forgotten city. He eventually puts on a diamond suit and goes to explore some of the routers but later finds that his batteries are too low to do much of any searching after that. The searchlight is dying and, and he tries to use it just at the doorway of the temple, right? Just so he could see it. And then he eventually tries again, but he can barely see inside. And he finally decides that he can only use electricity in emergency situations, which is like, okay, I'm glad you thought about that after the fact. On Saturday the 18th, two days before this actual um, recounting is written down and sent out, Carl is pretty much sat in the dark and starts to think that he was going to go mad like Kynes. He was pretty much feeling that sense of dread that most normal people feel similar to the crew, but I guess it didn't hit him as bad since he stayed with Kynes so much. And it's pretty clear that he was affected by the statue greatly, but I think some of his sanity was coming back, but not by much. In fact, I would almost venture to say that maybe with Kynes holding it, that was the reason what happened to the crew. Because apparently everyone was shaking, everyone was freaking out, but when you really listen to it, nothing happens to Kind. It's almost like the holder of the statue has control. But is the the holder in control or is the statue in control of them? And in that case, manipulating everybody. That's a really good question. He just ended up getting annoyed and had the light on, but fell asleep with the light on, and that killed the battery. Good job. He had matches, but used them up and was back in the darkness again, just waiting to die. He then realized that the strange god statue of the city was the same as a statue they took from that dead guy under deck before. This didn't scare him, but the revelation was definitely surprising to Carl. He'd taken some sedatives to help him sleep, but all he dreams about was the dead bodies of those he killed, looking into the porthole at him as he sleeps, including the young man who brought the statue to the sub to begin with. Just looking at him, being like, oh, I bet you could sleep it now, huh, motherfucker? Shit, but whatever. Carl is a very proud man. Carl's a very proud man. But on his last entry, Carl talks about being not of sound mind when he first starts out by saying he wants to go back to the temple again. When he happens to notice this light coming from outside of the sub. And then he started to hear some kind of music from the outside of the sub, like people singing hymns or something. And as he looks out the window to see where the light is coming from, Carl finds that it's from the temple itself. Which, you know what? Most people, they'd be freaking out about that. But at this point in time, like, man, you know what? What choice do you have? You might as well go into it all crazy and shit. As he looks out the window to see where the light is coming from, Carl finds that it's from the temple itself. Which is a whole red flag, but he's crazy, so it doesn't really matter. Well, he's saying he's, he, he's getting his sanity back. I don't know if I believe him. But deciding that he could no longer stop himself he decides to sit up again and bids the reader goodbye as he resolves to go back in the temple carl says that he's a very proud man and his pride was affected in a way that was just way too weird way too much 
There's not a lot of people killed over that statue. And he didn't even realize that his pride doomed everyone. Like I said, this story made me have to read it a few times before I actually could really understand what was going on. But it's an interesting story from a perspective that I honestly don't relate to, but can appreciate and understand as crazy as the dude was. But it's very clear that he should have made kind throw the statue back in the water. The fact that, like, all of these people in this story suffered, but it's kind at the very end that gets Carl to actually be nice for once. He requested something. The only reason he didn't kill Carl is because Carl had the statue. And he wanted that statue. And it was just like, what the fuck? Makes one wonder. Anyway, that was the temple by H.P. Lovecraft. I hope you enjoyed the tale. I'll be uploading this soon. You all have a good day. Hope you have a ha hope you had a happy new year, considering. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.